Got a little bit of the, got a little bit more of the wah pedal going on at this month. Hey, hi, and welcome back to another installment of Polly's Pile of Media. Can you believe that we are one third through the year already? Man, time really does fly when you're slowly going insane from the world burning down around us. But hey, it's springtime here in Polyland. We got the wind, we got some rain, we got some nice temperatures that are making it real easy to go out and grill up some good grub after a nice long hard day of work something that i will definitely be doing a lot more of over the next four or five months you can you can just safely bet on that because the the only thing i like as much as some nice fresh cantaloupe or sushi or some grilled up burgs and chicken and pork chops and steaks and all that good stuff so all that healthy meat consumption it, Keeps my plushy coat nice and plushy. Anyway, we're here once again to talk about what in the world I got up to in the world of media this past month. Hard to believe that this will be the first time that Flowers won't be making an appearance since it graduated last month. But we are definitely not short on things to talk about. So let's go ahead and roll that beautiful media consumption footage. Never has a band's name gotten me more excited than Rickshaw Billy's Burger Patrol. It's getting close to summer here in Polyland and I'm ready for some fresh grilled burgs and more importantly, in this exact moment, some hot summer jams. Big Dumb Riffs is exactly what it says on the tin. By the band's own admission, it's basically a concept album they challenge themselves to create, writing songs with as few notes as possible and riffs so down-tuned and chunky that any stoner or doom metal fan could at least appreciate how fat these riffs really are. And it's all in the name of having fun and being able to bounce around on stage and have more fun during their live shows, so that's rad. At a brisk 21 minutes, it's a very easy listen as they churn through 11 meticulously crafted, greased up, and punked out grooves. And while the concept is ridiculous and the songs rarely ever stretch beyond 2.5 minutes, it's amazing how these little rock gems are still capable of worming their way into your brain. It's almost like one part Red Fang, two parts Primus, and gloriously stupid. It may be a bit of a novelty to some, but it's charming because it's an album that really does feel like a band of extremely capable musicians just having fun, but also making good, albeit simple songs. If you want something from the Burger Boys with a little more meat between the buns, their previous efforts Beef Beast and Doom Wop are good places to start. But for what it is, Big Dumb Riffs is exactly what I wanted it to be. Anybody that knows me could tell you that I have a lot of love for mid to late 90s and early 2000s new metal. It's not an ironic love for that era of music either. I grew up when that scene was happening and I legit think that there's a lot of albums from that era that hold up really well. And if you'd like to hear me and Beepner talk about new metal for like four hours and rank a bunch of albums, then you can do that. There's a link to that video down in the info box if you want it. Spell Piercings by Gone Mage is a heaping dose of that rough and tumble new metal sound that's more akin to a hydra that combines the driving rhythms and riffs of groove metal, chiptune electronic loops, hip hop influence in both the instrumentals and vocals, and it's all served up with a heavy dose of black metal with some blast beats, high tempos, and fiery screeching vocals. All great sounds by themselves, but this album combines them all in a manner that it manages to feel both modern and like something I could probably find digging around old CD racks in a record store back in 1999. While spell piercings may have a pretty identifiable sonic palette, each track is its own little playground for these influences to mingle and play around in. 
It's an exciting listen because it's never exactly copying its inspirations note for note, it's just using them in new and interesting and sometimes even absurd ways. And it's the absurdity that ties this album together and makes it work, along with a clear love for an era of music that a lot of people still look back on with disdain. Not a bad pull for a one-off Bandcamp recommendation. It's been a long time since we've heard a proper follow-up from Atlanta-based noise sludge outfit Whores to their 2016 Hammer to the Head album Gold. They're back with a brand new monster truck of an album War, and it's an album that sounds exactly like what you'd expect an album to sound like that's named War, presented by a band named Whores. This album is just like a hulking beast that tramples along the countryside with its crushing guitar riffs, fuzzed out bass, and thundering drums just smashing and obliterating everything in its wake. Songs like Hostage Therapy and Imposter Syndrome lock into a slow, tight groove that left me feeling nice and flattened like a steamroller, while tracks like Hieronymus Bosch Was Right and Sicko left me splattered across a windshield like a helpless bug with their racing tempos. As someone who grew up a huge fan of both Melvin's and Helmet, Whores has always just hit the right spot for me, and there was just never any reason for me to think that War wouldn't hit the same way. It may not be the most groundbreaking or smart music in the world, but big ol' riffs, rasped out vocals, and fuzzed out bass are always gonna find a welcoming home in Polyland. I love you, whore! Anime is kicking off in high gear with Cyberpunk Edge Runners. And don't worry, you won't need to know much or anything about Cyberpunk 2077 to enjoy it, though after watching this series, I'm probably a step or two closer to checking that game out in the future now than I was before. David Martinez is having a really bad day. He's teetering on the verge of being kicked out of the high class school his mom is busting her ass to keep him in. His living situation is about to get, well, let's just say dramatically altered. And he's ended up in possession of an experimental piece of cyberware that a lot of other people want. So rather than getting too down about it, he decides to have the hardware fused to his body and runs off committing petty crimes with a cute girl he just met, which turns into a whole other situation that lands him in a small mercenary group that sees him putting his life on the line doing missions for all sorts of shady characters. And that's just the first two episodes, there's still eight more left. Edge Runners is a show with big characters, big action, and big presentation, and despite the fact that the narrative is mostly a drama, it just remains fun the whole time. The show's tone and atmosphere are palpable, and it's only heightened by the incredible animation and soundtrack that's just non-stop bangers. It is very clear from the jump that Studio Trigger was given a big bag of money and told to go make awesome thing, and that's exactly what they did. I also think this show's English dub is worth a special shout out. With a cast as unbelievably wild as this one, with such dynamic range and emotions, Capturing both the over-the-top energy as well as the quieter and more dramatic moments can often be tricky, but this cast just has it so dialed in that every line feels natural and believable. With incredible animation, a cast of characters that are as fun as they are intriguing, an easy to digest story, and action that'll keep your eyes glued to the screen, this one's going right on the list of shows like Black Lagoon, Bakano, and Akudama Drive that are perfect for getting new people into anime, or just shows that you you can show to someone that's not really into it, but they could enjoy it as a one-off. You may never be able to trust a soul in Night City, as Kiwi consistently reminds others throughout the series, but you can trust that Cyberpunk Edge Runners is a damn good time. Hoseki no Kuni slash Land of the Lustrous has finally come to an end. I am literally recording this segment mere hours after the final chapter dropped, so we're kind of in the moment with this one. The thing I can say for certain is that it ended only the way that it could have, and it was really nice. I know this is kind of a weird way to do a segment or something. I'm, I'm being very vague, and I'm not showing anything that's happened in the last 20 or so chapters on screen. 
you have to understand that at some point this manga flies off into a direction I just never saw coming. I mean, it goes bonkers in a manner that even I wasn't sure would work, but ended up really digging. And to talk too much about it would ruin it for the number of folks that I know who were waiting to get to this one when it finished, which I know also goes beyond my own friend's circle. When I step back and take in the enormity of this story and where Phosphophilite's journey started versus where they ended up, the mixture of emotions that well up in me are such a wild concoction. It's a story that I'm going to be thinking about for a long time going forward. Ichikawa-san has more than earned her deserved rest in PlayStation 5 time. What, you didn't think that this segment was just for anime, did you? I get around to watching movies every now and again, typically if friends are involved, and I'm even more inclined to do so if that movie is a Martin Scorsese flick that I have not gotten around to seeing yet. After Hours is a dark comedy focusing on a night in the life of Paul Hackett, a bored data entry employee who has a chance encounter with a young lady after work named Marcy who invites him over to her place late at night under the pretense of buying a paperweight sculpted by her roommate. During his visit, things begin getting incredibly strange and he soon finds himself wanting out of this situation as quickly as possible. Paul just wants to go home, and the movie is a series of wildly hilarious coincidences, occurrences, and unfortunate situations that get in the way of that. The movie has an incredible, thickly rich, dark mood draped over it that left me feeling unnerved and not knowing which way it was going to swerve at any moment. And the performances, especially those from Griffin Dunn, Rosanna Arquette, Terry Garr, and John Hurd, only make the crazy feel even crazier. After Hours is both subtly and overtly hilarious. Even when I saw setups for what I knew were going to be payoffs later, the writing, acting, and composition of the shots and scenes still made everything hit. If you want a comedy that's fun and weird in ways that you may not be expecting, this one is definitely worth a watch. I imagine lasting 25 years in any business is no easy task, and for Studio Bones to still be here 25 years after their inception is worthy of praise. And they were just as excited to mark the occasion with Metallic Rouge leading the charge for their 25th anniversary celebration. The show is set in a world where humanity has colonized a good portion of space and coexists with androids who are treated as second class citizens that must abide by Asimov's laws of robotics, creating an obvious slave and master dynamic. This conflict sits center stage and functions as the main reason for the clashing of ideals. Simultaneously, Rouge Redstar and her partner Naomi are sent on a mission to assassinate nine special androids who could pose a threat to humanity that hold MacGuffins that will play the biggest role in the story as it unfolds. Metallic Rouge is a show that tries to be a little bit of everything. It's an action show, a comedy, a big old thinky brain drama, but I was left mostly unimpressed with the wasted potential every piece of this show exhibits. Metallic Rouge has all the promise in the world with its tonal and thematic inspirations coming from Blade Runner and slick battlesuit designs feeling like they're more angular and agile send-ups to Kamen Rider, but at every single turn it fails to execute on these inspirations in any type of cool or meaningful ways. The characters constantly prattle on about the idea of freedom from their situation, yet they only ever react, and an incredibly dumb reveal in the final episode makes their entire pursuit of freedom null and void anyway. And to add insult to injury, Metallic Rouge barely farts itself across the finish line with one of the most limp-wristed nothing burger rushed as hell endings I've seen in years. And if that wasn't bad enough, the air gets sucked out of every good idea, scene, and cool premise by absolutely terrible pacing that often left me feeling like I'd somehow missed scenes or entire episodes with how wildly the narrative jumps around. Metallic Rouge's story isn't even all that complicated, yet it's still really hard to follow at times with how awfully scripted and paced it is. I've not seen a show fumble the ball as hard as this one in a while, and I stuck with it because I was really pulling for it to do literally anything with all of its cool ideas and designs. It just feels like something went terribly wrong somewhere, and the cool show that I feel is in here somewhere ended up getting buried and smothered under it.
Up first for games, we're gonna have a look at Introversion's 2017 walking simulator, Scanner Somber. The premise is simple. It's just you, a vast cave network for you to navigate in the pitch dark, and a LiDAR scanner that illuminates the areas around you. Fire it up and just start walking because, save for some light platforming here and there, that's all we're gonna be doing here, Chief. This is a game where I feel like both the art and sound design are doing pretty much most of the heavy lifting. This game looks really damn cool. I really like the visuals here. Each area is dense with ambiguous details for you to uncover in the environments, and the way the game uses its soundscapes and carefully placed insert songs lets Scanner Somber straddle the line between feeling fully immersive with its exploration and more cinematic and artistic when it's putting a pin in its more focused moments. Played in the dark with headphones, it was easy to immerse myself in the game's claustrophobic and oppressive atmosphere. It's never really much of a horror game or a scary experience, save for one area that kind of tries to be, but I absolutely was on edge the entire game. So even if the narrative is literally an indie game story cliche, and the details of the cave's history never really pulled me in or interested me all that much, I still had what I'd call a fairly unique experience in this game's world. Coming in at just about two hours, Scanner Somber still feels maybe a bit too big for its simple premise. Areas like the lake and the claustrophobic maze near the end of the game definitely had me feeling a little fatigued and maybe even a little frustrated too. But I'd still count my time with the game as an overall positive and given its low price for entry, I'd say that if you're at all interested in the concept or you like what you see here, go ahead and pull the trigger. What if I told you I had not one, not two, but three cute little free games to check out that can each be finished in about an hour. All three of the following games can be downloaded on Steam right now and are all worth a look. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that these games may be a part of some sort of initiative from Bandai Namco to test the waters for new IPs since they all come from the same developer and are seemingly published by Phoenix Inc, who I've never heard of prior to these games and who the hell does research? This is YouTube, baby home of mediocrity and misinformation. All three of these games dropped on the same day, so I'm sure that means something. Anyway, let's have a look. Up first, we have Boomerode, which maybe they could workshop that title a little bit. I don't know, like Boomerang Roadcraft, which is sort of the unlisted subtitle. That's, that seems a better fit, but, but, but whatever. Names aside, this one is just a super slick little platformer where you throw a boomerang that creates a rail that you can grind on in order to reach your next destination. The level designs are pretty wide open, so it's actually pretty easy to end up doing things in ways that are quite a bit off the critical path, and that's how you'll also end up finding the five collectible relics in each of the two stages. So not only is speed emphasized naturally by the game's mechanics, but there's a lot of fun exploration that you can get into with level designs being as wide open as they are. I definitely wish that there was more of this one to play around with because gliding around on rails and stopping mid-air to throw your next boomerang are mechanics that just feel really dope. I feel like this could be a really exciting entry into games akin to Cloud Built and Neon White if it were fleshed out a bit more. The building blocks are here for some really cool player expressions, so give this one a go and enjoy the high-flying zippiness. Rolling in next, we have Natolot, a short little light puzzler starring an adorable little orb robot that's been sent to be disposed of. In order to escape, you'll have to roll and dash through three stages of some simple 3D puzzling to get the job done. The key gimmick here is that you can hack into and control every enemy you see, which you'll need to do if you want to cross electric floors, fly to higher spaces, or crawl around on walls. You use all of these skills to solve each room, and while there's not a lot of variety in enemy types in the three stages we're presented with, there's still three hidden secrets in each area to find to keep you busy, and it's actually really easy to see that if this one were to be expanded into a fuller game, how more enemy types to hack into and control could add to the formula with more challenging and complex puzzles. Like Boomer Road, this also feels like a proof of concept, but it's one that's easy to see being built into something much, much more expansive and satisfying. 
And finally, we have the amazingly adorable and ultra messy Doronko Wonko. Also, that name is just really fun to say. Go ahead, try it. Doronko Wonko. In Doronko Wonko, you play the part of a cute and mischievous little Pomeranian puppo left to its own devices as a family moves into a new place and is preparing for a housewarming party. Your goal is to make the place as messy as possible while everyone is out of the house. Except for mom, who seems to be way too tired to be anyway invested in any of this at this point, which, having been through a few moves of my own, that's a big relate. As you create more chaos, you unlock all sorts of new gadgets to play with to aid you in your mess making, as well as cute cosmetics to doll our adorable pooch up with. At the start of the game, you're given a simple objective to find 12 hidden doggo emblems to unlock a secret room, but there's also a whole mess of goals for you to tackle, a la Untitled Goose Game's to-do list, which earn you badges. This one obviously earns big points for its cute factor, and it's the one that, to me, feels the most complete in its current form. It could obviously be a bigger game if they wanted to, since the family seems to be pretty well-to-do, and you could probably make it into a game about a mansion or something, but even as is, Doronko Wonko functions as a perfectly fun little standalone mischief creation game on its own, and is the one that I would probably recommend the most if anyone wanted my opinion on which of these three games to try out. Hypnospace Outlaw is worthy of the hype it receives. I don't need to wait until the end of this segment for my final thoughts because I am so late to the game in playing this one that I feel it's just obvious at this point. This is the game where you play as the internet police in a fictionalized world of late 1999 solving cases of infringement, harassment, and god knows what else in an online world accessed via sleep time computing. You'll have to use your search engine to find unlisted pages, dig through websites full of chunky GIFs and MIDI tunes, and even willingly buy into a number of scams and download viruses in order to solve the cases that are given to you. It takes a lot of lateral thinking and some leaps of logic to arrive at conclusions the further you get into the game, and it always felt satisfying when my efforts paid off, whether it was just a break in a case that I'd been stumped on or putting the final pieces together. It can be rough going sometimes, but that's okay. Hypnospace Outlaw is a game meant to be explored. You're meant to feel like you're adrift at sea and there's no time limit, so there's no reason to try and mainline the missions as fast as you can. The vibes and aesthetic are so genuinely loved on and there's so much content, charm, and personality in this game that you won't get if you simply just rush through things. The hours I spent just trawling through the garish late 90s web design, downloading little online pets and tools to play with, and enjoying the incredible amount of music packed into this game were definitely the highlight for me. I enjoyed the narrative, but I got way more out of this game just letting myself be lost and not worrying so much if I was making progress. Hypnospace Outlaw is a reminder of how much actual character the internet had before capitalism and tech bros strangled and homogenized the life out of it. There's just nothing entirely quite like Hypnospace Outlaw that I've ever played. The only games that even come close would be Uplink and Hacknet, and those are more focused on hacking and less on having distinct personalities like this game. The aesthetic and vibes are so completely unmatched and it's so palpable that even people who didn't grow up in this era of the internet can still cotton on to the charm and personality this game is going for. I'll definitely be revisiting this one again just to keep digging for more of the off-beaten path weirdness that I know I missed on my first playthrough. Give it a play, you will not regret it. And that will put a cap on the month of April. Oh hey, you might actually notice that I'm sounding maybe a little bit different right now. Well, I didn't recently just get over a cold or anything. I actually recently purchased a new microphone and by the time I got it and I dialed in all the settings the way that I wanted it, the segments for this month's video had already been recorded. So it didn't really make a whole lot of sense for me to go back and re-record everything. So I thought I'd just, you know, tuck a little note about it here at the end of the video. Enjoy the stunning new clarity and fuller profile of my voice. As always, 
Thanks so much for stopping by. If you saw anything in the video you want to talk about, let's have a good old fashioned uncivilized internet discussion about it down in the comments. And with all of that out of the way, we'll catch you next time we're together. Bye bye.